John chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1 through to the 13th verse. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Word of God. After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, that's tabernacles, was near. Therefore his brothers said to him, Leave here and go into Judea, so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, My time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet fully come. Having said these things to them, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. So the Jews were seeking him at the feast and were saying, Where is he? There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, He's a good man. Others were saying, No, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. Time's a precious thing. For as long as I can remember, I've had uh, interest, a fascination with time. I remember getting my first watch from my dad and being almost mesmerized by the concept of time. I watched the second hand, which on the first watch I received was a red second hand and watched it over and over. Journey, that long journey from zero to zero as it went around the face of the watch. I remember too my parents taking me to London many times. I had an uncle there, Uncle Sam, and we journeyed one day to go to the Royal Museum of Time in a place called Greenwich. Have you ever heard of Greenwich Mean Time? It looks like Greenwich, but it's pronounced Greenwich, I assure you, just outside London. It's a place noting the history of time and man's attempts to mark it in various different ways across human history. It's really the story of time. On the website of this same Royal Museum of Time, I was able to uh, secure this earlier today, Uh, the museum has this as a setting, what it writes about itself. We live our lives by it. We eat, sleep, and work by it, but what is time and who sets it? Discover everything there is to know about the story of time, from the relationship between Greenwich and time to the people responsible for inventing groundbreaking timekeeping instruments. Time, that's the end of the quote, time can be measured, but if you notice, no one can capture it. It's actually a Uh, A false statement to talk of a time management course. You you can't really manage time. No one can capture it, no one can manage it. It just goes on. Time itself is unmanageable. All we can do is make the best use of it, which is what Scripture says. Ephesians 5.16 says, Make the best use of your time, for the days are evil. We've been given this stewardship. One of the stewardships God gives us is health. One of the stewardships He gives us is uh, money. One of the stewardships is time. And time tends to slip away. Seconds turn into minutes. We know that. They turn into hours. They turn into days. And then weeks and months and years and decades. And every one of us is given a measure of time determined by God. He knows our birth date and our death date before we're ever born. Scripture reveals that. And every one of us is given the same measure of time in each day, 24 hours. Whether we're rich, whether we're poor, no one gets 25. No one is only given 11. 
Every one of us gets 24. Whether we're rich or poor, famous or unknown, 1,440 minutes in a day, which as you all know is 86,400 seconds. We all get the same amount of time every day. None of us can manage those seconds. Uh, we can't control those seconds. Time can't be paused. Can we just stop there for a moment? No, no, time is ticking on. And the tick becomes a tock. Every time, every day, all we can do is use time wisely and not waste it. When I think of uh, my mother who went to be with the Lord uh, just about uh, 18 months ago, I, I miss her deeply. And what I long for most is even, isn't it amazing, about 30 more minutes of time with her. To be able to just talk, be able to hear her, hear her voice once again. Uh, more than wealth, more than money, I just wish for more time. Once it's gone, it's gone. Time's a precious thing. Time can be a drag. Time can fly. It's a wonderful gift and it's a stewardship. But it's not something we own. God owns time. He's the Lord of time and He lives in eternity and created this thing called time. And He dispenses it according to His will. By our wills, we can't get more decades to our life. God is the one who gives us time. William James once said this, the great use of a life is to spend it for something that outlasts it. That's quite profound. Live life so that what you do outlasts time. To make our time count for eternity. Do you know, I brought with me something that you might find around our house in various different places, uh, an atomic clock. If you've been to our house, uh, you're very welcome to come. Um, you'll see a clock, an atomic clock, in just about every room of the house. Over a period of maybe 20 years, it's not an obsession. An obsession is, being, is when you buy three of them every week. Right? This is my defense in the, in the legal court of public opinion. But over a period of time, each room of the house has acquired an atomic clock. You see, I think if you're going to have a clock, let it tell the right time. Oh, so you're fascinated by time. I'm fascinated by time. Um, I like precision, accurate watches. That, does that mean you're always on time? Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no. But I know how late I am. <laughs> At the touch of a button, this particular atomic clock that I brought with me can be adjusted to uh, Pacific time. Do you know there's an ocean of difference between Pacific and specific? <laughs> an ocean of difference. Pacific time, and then uh, central time, then uh, uh, mountain time, then eastern time, and each time I press a button there's an hour difference in time. Now in spiritual terms, Ah, you knew I'd get there eventually. In spiritual terms, let me ask you, what time are you set to? So we look at this passage, Jesus speaks of two different times. We look in verse 6 with me. He says, so Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. My time and your time. In a very real sense, Jesus' schedule was set by the Father, set by the Father's will. He was on kingdom time. He was not about to dispense with what he was understanding as his Father's will. Uh, he had his receiver up and he was seeing what his Father was doing, he said, and hearing what his Father was saying. And so with that being his methodology, what he was about or what he was doing, his food, he said, was to do the will of him who sent me. He, he was set to do whatever was on the Father's agenda for the day, for the week, for the month, for the year. He was set on kingdom time. My time, you'll see that phrase again in verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify to it that its deeds are evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time, verse 8, has not yet fully come. He was on his father's agenda, 
nothing else mattered to him. His brothers didn't believe in him, this passage tells us, which is interesting. Actually, it would be hard to live with someone who's just that little bit ahead of you. Uh, He was never having to say sorry. He was always getting it right. If, If someone had a question, Jesus answered and was always truthful. He wasn't hiding things. He wasn't uh, something that was duplicitous. He was not doing one thing and saying another. He hadn't got a double life. There was nothing that he could uh, be seen to be doing that was um, uh, untoward, not uh, fulfilling the right uh, thing. He was able to say to his enemies, I'm not sure I could even say it to my friends. He was able to say to his enemies, which of you convicts me of sin? And everyone was silent. It would be hard to grow up around that, wouldn't it? Uh, Share a bunk bed with God in the flesh. And uh, his stories of his birth. And what would you do as a brother? Well, what's interesting is at least one of the brothers came to believe in him. James, the Lord's half-brother. The same mother, but a different father. But James is the only one we know of that became a true believer. But at this time, none of them were believing in him. And so they had an agenda. They, we don't know exactly what their motivation was. And that's, that's true in relationships and in marriage. We never truly know people's motivation. We can observe actions and make guesses. But at best, that's what they are. We don't know the motivations of people's hearts. But these four brothers, we know he had four from a passage in uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. The names are actually listed. James, who became a believer. Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Judas was a popular name. This is not Judas Iscariot. So he had these four brothers and they had an agenda and they didn't believe in him. But they had a familial a family connection with Jesus. And so they're thinking, well, you know, they they don't know exactly what to do with him. But in terms of career, in terms of getting his name out there, popularity, fame, you ain't going to do it in Galilee. You need to get to Jerusalem. That's the big place where the theologians are. That's where you need to go if you're going to thrive and start a religion. Obviously, you're into this, Jesus. You're doing miracles everywhere. We hear all of the reports. But it ain't going to cut it just staying in Galilee. Go up to the feast. Go up to Jerusalem. And there you'll be able to hang out and get the following. Because if you remember, John 6 has ended with the big following kind of deserting him. All right, career move. Go to, get yourself, get your face on television, right? Get yourself to Jerusalem. There's a big feast. Go there, do miracles. That'll be good for you. Again, we don't know their motivation, um, but they knew this. Whatever he was going to do, whatever he was about, whoever he was, he wouldn't accomplish what he needed to accomplish in Galilee. So, show yourself to the world. So we look at verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus was walking in Galilee, for he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. We know this from John chapter 5. The Jews here is speaking of the religious leaders, and they had already sought to kill him. Very, very clear what their agenda was. And so he stayed out of that arena. Verse 2, Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, tabernacles, was near. His brothers said to him, Leave here, go into Judea, so that your disciples may see your works which you are doing. Were they speaking in a real sense of, We believe in you, go do the miracles, it'll be great. Well, well, they won't believe us, but whatever their motivation was, perhaps I think it's more credible to say they had a family relationship and maybe they just wanted him away anyway. And so they said, that's where you need to go. If you are what you claim, if you are what is being claimed about you, then go get it tested out in Jerusalem. That will be the acid test of your ministry. Prove it, in other words. Prove you are who you say you are when the big wigs with the big heads can assess whether you truly are the Messiah. But verse 5 tells us they were not believers. I think that's amazing, but it also tells us and reveals to us the truth of what we've already already read in John 6. No one can come to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. You can be around Jesus, sleeping at night, 
seeing him in the day, seeing his interactions, and even witnessing his miracles and not believe in Him. It takes an act of God, it takes a miracle for anyone to be a Christian, including the brothers who lived around Him. Do you know you can be around church and not know Christ? A lot of people when they talk of conversions into other forms of Christianity, they, talk, they say, I came into the church at this time. But to come into the kingdom, you've got to come to know Christ, not just have the trappings of religion. They had the trappings. They knew a lot. You could get a lot of information about Jesus you wouldn't know from the brothers, but they did not believe in Him. When we have something like an atomic clock, do you know we have something that uh, in scientific terms is stated like this? An atomic clock is a clock that uses the resonance frequencies of atoms as its resonator. Did I go too fast? Yep. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, the resonator is regulated by the frequency of the microwave electromagnetic radiation emitted or absorbed by the quantum transition energy change of an atom or molecule. Moving right along. I mean, did you follow that? I, I'm not really uh, able to follow that, but it, it sounds good, and that's what you find when you look up what is an atomic clock. But in layman's terms, something I can understand, an atomic clock automatically synchronizes with something else, with some generating factor that is telling the clock what the time is. So take the batteries out, reinsert the batteries. That atomic clock is looking for a reception and has built into it the ability to receive information from somewhere else. From somewhere like Boulder, Colorado, a signal is being sent out and a good atomic clock catches the signal and adjusts time so that time is synchronized. When people are going to rob a bank, you've seen it in the movies, unless you've done it yourself, but you, you see it in the movies, you know, let's, let's synchronize our watches. We'll do the big deed at uh, 11.15. And so let's, what time does yours say? Let's synchronize watches. The word sin means the same, S-Y-N, not S-I-N. Sin means same. And chronos is the Greek word for time. So it means same time. So what is happening in Boulder, Colorado is synchronized now by this particular clock which is receiving the signal and both are now saying the same thing. They are synchronized. Same time. They're saying the same thing. So I love this concept of time as you maybe can tell. And I love having accurate clocks around me telling me what the right time is. I remember, this is just an aside, but I remember my mother uh, watching television with me. We, were, we didn't watch a whole lot of television, but various times she said, um, I, I'd like to watch the news at 6, and when it was about 5.57, if I could remember it. She said, would you turn the channel over to where the news is uh, playing? And I said, yeah, I will. And as 58 came and 58 went and... 59 came. She was getting more and more agitated because they hasn't, hadn't yet changed the channel. And as we were getting very, very close to, uh, to, to the 6 o'clock time, she was looking at her watch. Now, she had no real love of time as I did. And so her little watch was a couple of minutes fast. How can you live like that? I, I, I just... How can you do it? Uh, 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 but she lived that way and was, was happy nonetheless. Well, as... Ten seconds before um, six o'clock came, I did not still look like I was about to change the channel. But I had it ready in my hand. The finger was on the button. And at 5.59 and 56 seconds, I remember it distinctly, I changed the channel. And you know that little bit of time it takes, a little bit of time it takes for the channel to change was just enough time so that with one second to spare, I got to the news channel. Correct me if I'm wrong, you were probably there at the time. And with one second to spare, there was a moment of silence, and then suddenly the news came on. And all her agitation fell away. No, she was still annoyed with me, because I'd left it to the last second. 
time is either of interest to you or it isn't. But Jesus was on the Father's time. And I don't think the brothers who had anything malicious going on in their hearts, perhaps they did, but it seems more likely to me that they were just about what would be the worldly idea of what would be good as a career move. As a career move, get out from Galilee. This is the time of the feast. If you're going to be the Messiah, don't do this Messiah gig in Galilee. Get where the people are. And that's what we see in verses 1 through 5. He delayed from going back to Jerusalem. The Feast of Tabernacles was approaching. Jesus' brothers suggested he go with them and do miracles there. But they were still non-believers. And Jesus explained that his agenda trumped theirs. He was in charge. For them, any time is right. Whatever you want to do, career move, just get yourself in front of people. Any time is good. For Jesus, he said, my time is not yet come. Implicit in all of that is that he's operating according to a different agenda. He'd set his clock to the kingdom time. May I ask you, what's your agenda? Have you set your clock to the Father's time? You see, we're to set our clocks in terms of our life direction according to God's precision instrument that is far more accurate than the atomic clock the Bible. The Bible is God's precision instrument, more valuable to us than even the cockpit instrument in a plane, which is the most expensive part of the plane because people live and die by those instruments. They need to know where mountains are. They need to know how high off the ground they are. They need to know that should they continue in their uh, course, that they're going to hit a mountain. They need instruments that can tell them that when they cannot see anything with their eyes. When they move from visual flight rules, VFR, to instrument flight rules, because they can't see out. It's snowing, or it's dark, it's so dark they can't see. They have to go by IFR, instrument flight rules. They live and die by those instruments. And we ought to live and die by this, by the Word of God. So what's your clock set to? Do you have a weekly calendar that reveals you're on kingdom time? With your time, with your talents, with your treasure. I believe the first thing on the agenda of a Christian is Lord's Day worship. And I'm speaking to the choir because you're here. But it's the first agenda. We live by what God de has declared is the means of grace. We say, that's what I want to be about, the Father's will, the Father's business. And He says, I'm going to summon all my people to worship me on the day I have chosen together and do things according to my pattern. So that when we come, we're on kingdom time. We do what He wants. We read the Scripture. We pray the Scripture. We worship Him in spirit and truth. We have the Lord's Supper. We do what He has commanded. And we, uh, we, we, we are celebrating that without frills. We're just on His time. We operate according to the Father's mandates. If you look in verse 6, we see how John reveals that Jesus remained for a time in this royal Galilee setting, but then eventually journeyed to Jerusalem secretly. It's as if he's got a clock, and he's, it's, it's not literal clock, but he's, he's, he's analyzing what the Father is saying to him, and the Father is saying, stay, stay, stay. And the signal is, stay, stay, stay. So he's not going. He's not going. No, I'm not going. No, I'm, go I'm not going. But when the signal changed, go, immediately, he goes. He's about his father's business. But he does so secretly and not with the family party. Then we look in verse 9. Having said these things, he stayed in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he himself also went up, not publicly, but as if in secret. Then verse 11 reveals that there are now disputes about Jesus' identity. And that had continued. This was nothing new. Jesus often would ask, uh, who do people say that I am? As in Matthew 16. And the reaction of the disciples, well, well, some say this, some say that. Some say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets or Elijah. And then maybe John the Baptist who's come back from the dead. There's a lot of uh, uh, ideas, concepts out there. There's lots of ideas about who Jesus is today. 
Uh, but then Jesus said, now who do you say that I am? You that are with me, you that are my disciples, you that have been observing me, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, you didn't get that from CD of the month. Uh, you didn't get that from some bulletin, some uh, press review. No, you didn't get that from flesh and blood. But my Father has revealed that to you. You're blessed, Peter. Blessed are you. My Father has revealed that to you. Has He revealed who Jesus is to you? Do you know who He is? Is He the joy of your heart? And so the disputes were continuing. The Jews, the Jewish leaders already wanted to kill him. Matthew 5, 18 tells us that. I've referred to this. Let's look at it. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking, that's speaking of the religious leaders, were seeking all the more to kill him. They didn't like his sermons. Because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but was also calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. They knew the implications of what he said. You see, a lot of people love Jesus in theory. But they don't want to hear what he says. And Jesus makes it clear that you can't love him and forsake and put to the side his words. It's the words of Jesus that show us the true identity of Jesus. Jesus said certain things about himself and if they're true, everyone is accountable concerning what they do with this Jesus. And if it's untrue, He's either, as C.S. Lewis put it, a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. There's nothing much else that could be going on there. He claimed to be the way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and my Father are one. All of these claims over and over testified to his deity and the Jews, the Jewish leaders, knew it. And so they are seeking for him, it says in verse 11 of chapter 7 of John. John 7, 11. Therefore it says, the Jews were seeking him at the feast. Not to fellowship, they wanted to kill him. And were saying, where is he? Verse 12 and 13 reveal the public sentiment. There was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. Some were saying, he's a good man. Yes, yes, good man. Yes. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. So public opinion varied. Good man or deceiver. To lead someone astray means deceptions involved. That was actually the religious leader's view. We see that in Matthew 27, 63. We see it in uh, John 7, later in this chapter. Look at uh, verse 47. It says, The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? They really believed that Jesus was a deceiver. But there were people who did believe in him, but it says no one was speaking, verse 13, openly of him for fear of the Jews. Again, fear of the Jewish leaders who had a lot of clout, a lot of weight, and they didn't want to voice their opinion about Jesus openly. So the talk was going on, but it was in a whisper, so to speak. But Jesus was doing things in public, and he was saying things in public, and when he was arrested, that's what he said. Look, I haven't done anything in secret. You could have come to my meetings and heard my claims. But the point of all this, I think, is this time factor. Because Jesus delayed in going and then went when the Father said, Okay, son, now's the time to go. He was set to kingdom time. And the events of Jesus' life were ordered by the Father. We see this testimony right through the Scripture. Concerning the birth of Jesus, we read this in Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. At the fullness of time, at the cross-section of human history, when everything was prepared, the Romans had built their roads so straight throughout Europe, so that even modern-day motorways and freeways are built on the top of these Roman roads. They are so straight. And the Greek language has spread so that with just simply the gospel writers writing in Greek, all throughout the entire empire could hear the gospel and read of the gospel because the Greeks had made 
everyone who had come under their sway learn Greek. The time was the fullness of time when it was so opportune for the gospel to spread. And in the fullness of the time, God sent forth His Son. Not 300 years before, not 300 years later, but at the fullness of time, at the Father's discretion. Jesus said so much about this. In John chapter 8, it speaks of His life. And in chapter 8, verse 29, He who sent me, Jesus said, is with me, and He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. I'm set on kingdom time. I'm about my father's business. That's all I'm operating under. So, here we have the brothers say, go to the feast. Jesus said, my time's not yet come. No, but later, probably a good while later, a few days later, he said, yes, my time has come. I'm going, but he did so secretly. Let's turn in our Bibles to chapter 2 of the book of Acts to the right after John is the book of Acts. And in verse 22, let me just read a section. It's the preaching of Peter on the day of Pentecost. This one who had uh, denied Christ, was restored by Christ, and was preaching on the first day of this new era of the outpoured Holy Spirit. Verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God, with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst just as you yourselves know. See what he's doing? He's appealing to their eyes and ears, what they've seen. You know this. This was not just something you observed on a television screen. You've seen it. Maybe you yourself have received a miracle from God or someone you know who had a desperate condition, has been healed. You know it. I'm talking to your mind. You can observe it. You've seen it. You've seen things that stand up to scrutiny. They are real miracles. Do you know what? Not even the enemies of Jesus disputed that Jesus' miracles were real. That was not the issue. Their big issue was he did it on the wrong day. But they never disputed real miracles were occurring. Ladies and gentlemen, in some of the Crusades, in fact... Just about all the miracle crusades that are taking place. The really, really, really sick people are never seen. They're put in a, 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 a room where no one can see them because it would bring down their faith when they saw the quadriplegic, when they saw the person that can't move a muscle and they're in a chair and they've been in that locked condition for years and years and years. But the people who have some kind of a mobility, they're there with their wheelchairs on the front row. And when they get up, you don't see them before the service walking around, but maybe they could. But when Jesus does a real miracle, ladies and gentlemen, it holds up to scrutiny. If one of those quadriplegics, those people in a desperate physical condition were healed, it'll be front page news, but we're still waiting. Does God do miracles? I believe He does amazing healings, but I believe for some people they're not going to see that healing till they meet Jesus face to face. God is Lord over when He heals, even though He is the healer. Thank God there'll be no sick people in heaven. You'll have no eyesight issues. Uh, what, what hymn number is that? Uh, you're not going to have to is that you Paul <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, kind of, I can't remember stuff don't ask me too many questions you know no continue reading you yourselves know this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Man today, with his uh, sophistication, looks down on primitive Christianity and says, oh, they believe in miracles, virgin births and resurrections. <laughs> no one believes in that stuff. We don't believe anyone can be raised from the dead. Well, the view of the Bible is it was impossible not for him to be raised from the dead, but for him to stay dead. When, the God, when God the Father acted, it was impossible for Jesus to stay dead. Praise the Lord. Look at this in verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you, 
Now, who's the you? It's people in Jerusalem. Listen, if you're going to start a religion based on the Jewish scripture and you are a false teacher, a false prophet, just a word of advice, don't start that thing in Jerusalem. You see, saying you observe resurrections, you observe people being raised from the dead, no. They could say, no, we never saw that. We never saw a miracle. And the thing would just be over at the first meeting. Would you all come back? No. You're talking about something that's... Do you know, well, this, when, 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 when the gospel writers wrote, they sometimes wrote 20 years after the event. And, well, you know, we can go back even further in our history and we can remember things like uh, Ronald Reagan and JFK. And if someone came to the service today and say, you all remember how J JFK went to, went, went to Phoenix in, in 1961 and raised people from the dead, right? No. Uh, we can remember that far back. And for these people, it had just been weeks since Jesus died and rose again, and he was in their face. He said, come on, you know, you crucified this one, and God raised him from the dead, and you know it. That's convicting. You know, if you're a false religion, start in Seattle, Washington. Some, go someplace around the world. They've, they've never seen a miracle of Jesus. But he could look them in the face and say, you saw the miracles. You saw him raised dead. You saw miracles, wonders, and signs. And you know it. And it was testimony to you of who Jesus is. He was about his father's business. Well, verse 29, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, the Messiah, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, that's the place of the dead, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Four days later, the third day, he was, he was raised. He looked ahead and spoke of that resurrection. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you now see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven. You can hail him as a hero. Okay. But God never said this of David. He himself says of this one though, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all the house of Israel, Jerusalem, let everybody in Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Wow. You're the ones who said, Crucify him, crucify him. And God says, I'll raise him from the dead. And Romans 1.4 says he was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. Alright, you killed him, God said, but that's my son and he's not staying there. He's not going to undergo any kind of physical decay. And on the third day, I'm raising him from the dead, which is public testimony to everybody that he is who he claimed to be. He's risen from the dead. And son, sit in my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. Look in chapter 4, we have the early prayer of the church. Verse 28 or 27. The church did not misspeak when they spoke of God and His ordinance of time. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. Just for a moment. Many of you understand this. When there's a wedding and you think, right, 85 things have to happen all coordinated so that at 11.15 a.m. everything is in the right place. The cake is there, check. The rings are in the right place, you got them in your pocket, best man, check. The best man's there, you check. The husband's there, the bride's coming. Yeah, we need the bride, we need the bride to be, yeah, she has, but we need mother-in-laws, we need father-in-laws, we need, we need this section, we need that section, we need this, we need that, we need 85 things to come together, it all comes together. That's what's going on at the cross. Look, what's, well, look what we read here. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. That's a reference to him being Messiah. Both Herod. Herod needs to do his part. 
And Pontius Pilate, he has to do his part. Without that, we can't get the job done. Along with the Gentiles, we need the Gentiles, that's the Romans, to do their part, and the peoples of Israel. And we need them to kind of converge and make it all happen on Good Friday. That's a lot to put together. That's better than a wedding cake. That's better than a wedding. And this is the plan of God from all the ages. God in eternity past planned the crucifixion. The Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. God was not surprised when men fell, when Adam fell, and we fell with him. And God had set up a plan of redemption even before the first tick turned into a tuck and time began. God said, let's mark the Lamb as slain before we start making this world. And time marched on. The fall came. The sun came. The sun lived. The sun died under the hands of these men, under the hands of, of people who were against Christ, against His anointed, as Psalm 2 makes clear. And yet, their wills were involved. They really wanted to do what they did, but all of it was foreordained by God. Wow. Let me say it backwards. Wow. It's amazing. Look at verse 28. To do, they're all doing their thing. To do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Oh, there's that word predestined, Mildred. Start the car. <laughs> there it is. It's a biblical word. And they did what they wanted to do. And you know, in heaven and in hell, everyone is there because of what they want. The people in hell don't want Christ. They don't want the torments of hell. They just don't want Christ. If you were to go into hell and see the vast throngs that are there and say, all of you can come out, just one condition, you bow your knee before the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge Him to be your Savior, your Lord, they will swing the door back in the face of any angel who made that proclamation. Why? Their hearts are still unchanged. They don't want Christ. The fact that you want Him is a miracle because by nature we don't want the biblical God. We don't want Christ. And these men, these women, all did what they wanted with Christ and all of it was predestined by God. Do you understand that, John? Not a bit of it. I can't wrap my head around that. My head is finite. I can't get the ocean in a glass. I can't comprehend it, but I believe it because the Bible teaches it. God is sovereign and man is responsible. Those things are clearly taught. And these verses tell us both Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the peoples of Israel, they're all responsible and God was entirely sovereign through it all and predestined that His Son would be crucified in time, in a certain place, on a certain day and three days later be raised from the dead. That's the kind of God who's in control of your life and that's why you can have trust. That's why you can trust His promises. This is not a weak God just hoping things work out or rolling the cosmic dice along the heavenly corridor hoping things work out and He rolls it and we observe it and thankfully He wins. Okay, He wins. It comes up the right number. God wins. Oh, ule, ule. That's not it. The God has planned your life is the God who knows everything, who's ordained all the events of time, and your time is in His hands. That's the only God there is. Don't fall for another sucker. Don't fall for another false God. There isn't one. There's only this God, the God of the Bible, who rules and reigns. Don't, false. Don't fall for a word of faith, charismatic leper. That's what he is. He's not God on the throne. He's hoping you say certain things so that you get certain things. That's not the God of the Bible. I fell for that God. I worshipped that God. It was a falsehood. There's only one God. The one who rules on the throne. He rules over heaven. He rules on the earth. And time is in his hand. And ladies and gentlemen, time is in your... Time is in God's hand concerning you. This day, God has ordained the very situation you face so that you trust Him. Excuse me getting excited, but that's the God who reigns. I'm so glad I don't have to get a message up the channels. Well, God's not available right now, but talk to Angel Pentos. 
Angel Pentos, can you get a message? I, oh no, I'm not qualified to go that far. I, I'll get it to this guy and that guy and that saint and he'll get it to that one. And You see, God's busy and he's kind of a hard man. But if you get a word to Jesus' mother, maybe the mother will have a word with the son. Listen, Mary has never heard a prayer uttered from this earth. Her peace in the presence of God is because of her son who's given her right standing with God. Her own testimony was this, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And her peace behind at the throne of God is, uh, is not unsettled because us and Mildred and Daphne are calling, hey Mary, uh, can you help me? Do you know she is undisturbed? And the Bible says prayer is a kind of worship and that's why we're to give only God our worship and pray only to Him because our time is in His hands. Don't fall for the false God of Mary because the true Mary would want you to serve Christ. The true Mary would say, pray the way my son taught you to pray, to the Father in the name of Jesus. It's interesting, in all of the records of the Apostle Paul, all his letters, guess how many times he talks about Mary? Zero. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Sorry to get excited. No, I'm not sorry. <laughs> this Jesus is coming back. This Jesus said, time is in my hand and the Father has decreed a time when I will come back. And in John 14, 3, he says, I will come again. You can trust him. He's the answer to this world. And that, ladies and gentlemen, trumps everything. I don't care who's on the throne in England, who's on the throne in China, who's ruling the masses. God is on the throne. And this world will not end because some despot has got his finger on a button somewhere. It's coming back <laughs> to haunt people. All the fear mongering. All the, the, the many people who can't sleep at night because they're worried about this, worried about that. God has shown us how time will end how he will be Lord over history and you and I need to trust him I'm in church so I need to calm down let me quote a lengthy quote and I'll finish with this Dr. James Montgomery Boyce in speaking of the difference between God's time and our time he said if we understand what Jesus meant by declaring that his time was not the same time as the time of his brothers if we are to gain insight from that for the time that is given to us, we must begin with the recognition that God's time is different from our time. In fact, it is questionable whether we can use the word time in reference to God's time at all. Time is a word for creation and God is not in time. God is outside time. He stands in eternity. Consequently, we should not make the mistake of applying time concepts to him. All of that is absolutely excellent theologically. There is no good illustration of how God relates to what we call time because every illustration, every word that we can draw upon has time limitations. You see, we're time-bound creatures and we can't understand what it is to be in eternity. We've never experienced it. Hmm. Nevertheless, some people have been helped by the following. Oh, I'm all ears. I'd like some help. How about you? We must imagine a river winding across a countryside. It begins in a mountainous interior, passes down through evergreen forests, across coastal plains and into the sea. Moreover, we may imagine a man in a rowboat making his way down this river. He's in the mountains on Monday, among the trees on Tuesday, in the midst of the plains on Wednesday, and at the river's mouth on Thursday. For him, the mountains, forests, plains, and sea are in a time sequence. He sees only one of these geographical features at a time. On the other hand, we can imagine a pilot flying five miles above the Earth's surface and we can see that for him all the geographical features are present at the same time. He can see all the way from the mountains to the seas in one glance. 
God sees like the pilot because he's not confined by time. And we can make the same point also by imagining time to be something like a motion picture. We view it in sequence. God views it as though it were millions of individual frames all seen at once. From his perspective, now hear this, God sees Adam and Eve, Abraham and Isaac, Christ on the cross, you and me simultaneously. This is not just an interesting play of the imagination, of course, for it has bearing on what we understand of God and his relationship to our days. We see it primarily in the area of what you and I call decision. For us, a life in time is filled with decisions. We make decisions constantly, and we do so in an effort to cope with variableness, ignorance, previous indecision, and other things. Our decisions are attempts to deal with problems not previously considered. God's decisions are not like this because of the nation, nature of his relationship to time. There is no variableness or indecision with God. Consequently, his decisions are rather in the nature of eternal decrees, unchanging and unchangeable. The Westminster Shorter Catechism speaks of these decrees saying, The decrees of God are his eternal purpose, according to the counsel of his will, whereby for his own glory he hath foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. That's a line that is then explained in that particular catechism. And then Dr. Boyce sums it up. I believe that this could be a great step forward in your spiritual life if you can see it. Now hear this. God does not make decisions because he suddenly is confronted with a problem that he's not foreseen. He determines both, now hear this, the problems and their solutions in advance. He's never surprised never caught off balance. Thus, there is never a problem that battle, baffles him or a work that he does not intend to finish. Because of this, we can rest in him and trust him for the ordering of our days. And ladies and gentlemen, isn't that where we live? We can trust a God who knows everything. You see, oftentimes we think, if I was God... I would do this and not that. But just remember, you're not God and you don't know everything. And the one who does know everything has ordained, in a certain sense, everything. And in his wisdom, he has declared the end from the beginning. He's a God who is Lord over time. So you can trust him. And this Christ is the one who lived by his Father's schedule. He set his will to be on the Father's time, kingdom time, I'm calling it. And I want to ask you, where are you? Have you set your heart so that you obey what Jesus said? You seek first. Your priority is not your time, but his. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. Can I just end with this and challenge you, challenge me, or challenge all of us? Today, would you adjust your clock to kingdom time? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, this one who in time came, lived sinless life, died gruesome but atoning death, for sinners, for all those who would ever call on your name. And Lord Jesus, you bore the sins that we had committed, though you had committed none. You bore our sins in your body on the tree, as Scripture says. The death was not the end. You were raised from the dead and are now seated as Lord of history and of time so that history... It's his story. You will be seen to be the ruling king when you come back. And Lord, we would submit to you and we would put our lives in your hands receiving the gift of forgiveness because your blood was shed for us. 
You bore the wrath that we deserve. We bring only sin to this equation. And you give us forgiveness and righteousness. The righteous life of Christ credited to us through mercy and grace alone. And that is the gospel. Not a religion of do, 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 but of done, done, done. See it. See what the Son has done. And rejoice in the Son. For he has given you right standing with this one who is the true God, Father, Son, and Spirit, forever. Lord, we thank you for this. And may our lives reflect the fact that we have adjusted our schedule to yours, our life to your will, our will to your will, so that we would say, not my will, but yours be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. This little piece of earth, my flesh, as it is in heaven. And we thank you all our provision is found in this one. He is the Savior, the Healer, the Lord of glory, the Provider, the Shepherd. He's all we need. Help us to see and be satisfied in Him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.